Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning to talk about Diabetes 101, a roadmap for good health. My name is Pat Munns. I'm a nurse practitioner and a certified diabetes educator in New Jersey, and I work in two practices, a, an, endo, an endocrinology practice uh, where I see patients that have diabetes, and in a primary care practice where I see lots of patients who have other health problems, but a lot of them also have diabetes, so I get to see them and take care of their, their diabetes as well. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. I uh, would love for you to have some questions, but would love for you to hold them until the end. So at the end of the conference, there will be time for you to type in your questions, and we will answer them at the end. All right, let's get started. Okay, so having some technical difficulties here with the slide. Okay, so let's first start talking a little bit about what is diabetes, and we're specifically talking about type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a pretty complicated disease. Um, it's not just a little bit of sugar in your blood, like a lot of people like to say. It has, there's, a, there's a bunch of, um, of several organ systems that are responsible for managing and maintaining blood sugar, and several of them are not working properly, in particular the pancreas. Uh, we know that when someone has type 2 diabetes, their pancreas is not making as much insulin as it used to, and when people are diagnosed with diabetes, about 50% of the cells in the pancreas don't make insulin. So we have a problem, number one, with the pancreas. We also have a problem with the insulin not working as well as it should, and that's something called insulin resistance. And so the body does try to make extra insulin. Uh, the pancreas, I should say, tries to make extra insulin, but the body doesn't use it as well as it should, and so therefore we have something called insulin resistance. And then we have another big player in glucose control, and that is the liver. The liver typically stores extra sugar. Let's backtrack for just a moment, and I'll talk a little bit more about the liver. But when we eat something that has carbohydrates, for instance, a bagel or a cereal or bread or milk or fruit or vegetables, those kinds of foods turn into sugar. And that sugar first gets absorbed into the bloodstream and then uh, the insulin uh, takes that uh, uh, sugar and delivers it to the muscle cells. And the body will take up as much glucose as it can into the muscle cells, but any extra sugar that is not taken up by the muscle cells goes into the liver, sort of as a storage house, if you will. And it, the glucose or the sugar, those words I use interchangeably, uh, go into the liver, and they are there in times of when we're not eating. So when we're not eating, the liver will release sugar so that we have a little bit of energy or glucose in those times when we're not eating. Well, the liver in type 2 diabetes does store glucose, but it pours out the glucose all day long and all night long when it's really not supposed to. And that's one of the problems in diabetes is that the liver makes too much sugar. So now we have a pancreas that doesn't make enough insulin. We have insulin that's not working as well in the body. And then we also have a liver that makes too much sugar. And all of that ends up into the bloodstream. And as it says on the slide, these abnormalities can cause sugar to build up in the blood and lead to severe medical problems over time. And that's why diabetes or sugar in the blood can be a real problem in terms of complications um, and we'll talk more about that in, as we proceed. So now the question is, is how common is type 2 diabetes? And I bet that if we polled everyone listening, you would know someone else besides yourself that has diabetes, or especially type 2 diabetes. As you can see on the slide, 25.8 million people, or 8.3% of the population, and this is in the United States, have type have diabetes. About 10% of those people have type 1 diabetes, which is a very different type of diabetes, which we won't focus on. But that's where the pancreas makes absolutely no insulin, and that person, uh, their life depends on insulin injections forever. Nine out of 10 people have type 2 diabetes, which is a more common type. 
and that's our focus today. Seven million people are undiagnosed. There are a lot of people that are currently walking around right now that have diabetes and don't know it, and that's unfortunate because there's a lot of uh, health, there are a lot of health problems that can be occurring without the person knowing about it, and so um, when they finally do get diagnosed with diabetes, they may already have complications such as kidney disease or eye disease or heart disease that could have been prevented if they were diagnosed sooner. And then we have another category of people called prediabetes, and look at that number. 79 million people have prediabetes. That means that their blood sugars are not high enough to con be considered having type 2 diabetes, but they have, um, but, but if they don't do anything about their weight, their exercise, their diet, they may go on to develop diabetes. And so folks that have prediabetes are in a good position because they can prevent from getting diabetes if they know they have prediabetes. So who gets type 2 diabetes? We're going to go through this list. Many of you may sit back and say, wow, I had all of those things or a couple of those things before I got diagnosed with diabetes. Maybe you have a family member or your children or your parents have some of these risk factors. And these would be red flags to, sh to show that people should get tested for diabetes. So the first one, of course, is having prediabetes. And we will talk in a few minutes what those numbers mean. Being over the age of 45 is a risk factor. However, unfortunately, children are one of the fastest growing groups of people that are developing type 2 diabetes because of our lifestyle, uh, being overweight, not being as active as we used to be. So children are at very high risk. Having a family history of type 2 diabetes is also another big risk factor because type 2 diabetes is extremely hereditary. Being overweight, having high blood pressure, Anything over 140, over 90 is considered too high. When people have diabetes, we want their blood pressure to be under 130, over 80. But having high blood pressure alone does, <clears throat> excuse me, place you at risk for developing diabetes. Then we have problems with cholesterol. <clears throat> excuse me. We have uh, one of the risk factors for developing diabetes is a low HDL, which is the good cholesterol, or as sometimes we call it the happy density lipoprotein. Unfortunately, people who have low good cholesterol are at risk for developing diabetes. And they oftentimes also have high fat in the blood or something known as triglycerides. So high triglycerides and low HDL place one at risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Lack of regular exercise is another risk factor. And unfortunately, many people don't exercise. It doesn't mean that they're going to get diabetes. But coupled with all of these other risk factors, it puts you at a higher risk. And then members of a certain ethnic group, African Americans, Hispanics, Asian folks, these are people that have a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And a history of gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes means having diabetes during pregnancy. So obviously this is something that, is just, that just happens to women. And during the uh, weeks of 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy, women are tested to see if they have gestational diabetes. Some women are actually tested earlier if they are in a higher risk group. Um, but many women, or most women, I should say, are tested during the uh, weeks 24 and 28 to see if they have gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes generally goes away once the baby is delivered but the woman has a 60% chance of developing type 2 diabetes later on in life, so gestational diabetes is a risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes. So now we want to know how is diabetes diagnosed. If we were sitting around in a room together, we would all have a different story about how we got diagnosed with diabetes. Some people may have had symptoms of diabetes, which we'll talk about. Other people may have not, didn't know that they had it, and they just went for a routine test at their doctor's office. Some people may have had a problem with their heart or a problem with their vision and went to their doctor, and then they were tested for diabetes. So there's lots of stories out there as to how people got diagnosed. But a couple of things that are important here. 
it can be silent for many years before it's diagnosed, and we already have touched on that. A lot of people are walking around with, with diabetes and don't know they have it because generally the blood sugars need to be around 180 or 200 before the body starts to give you symptoms that it's not happy that the sugars are that high. And unfortunately, a lot of damage can be done when the sugars are in the 140s and 150 and higher range. It can also be diagnosed on routine blood work. So maybe um, you know, your friend goes and gets their blood tested tomorrow just for some routine blood work and their blood sugar comes back in the diabetes range and they didn't know that they had diabetes. That, it can be diagnosed that way. It can present with serious signs and symptoms. So some people can have severe weight loss, severe thirst and urination, very dry skin. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit about some of the symptoms in a few minutes. And sometimes it can be found when someone has had a heart attack or a stroke or a foot infection. Some people go to the doctor's office for a very bad foot infection that won't clear up. And the first question that will be asked is, do you have diabetes? And the person will probably say no because they don't know that they have it. And then they get tested and we find that they have it. People come into the hospital, into the emergency room with a heart attack. And they're asked, do you have diabetes? And they say no. And unfortunately, they probably had it for a long time and didn't know it and now they have an unfortunate event, such as a heart attack or a stroke. So obviously, it's very important to get an early diagnosis of diabetes. And if you know that you have the risk factors or someone in your family has risk factors, they should get tested. Let's talk about what are the symptoms of diabetes. Again, some people don't get any symptoms because if the blood sugars are abnormal but not extremely high, typically, um, less than 180, uh, you most likely won't have any symptoms. But I've seen people that have come into the office with blood sugars in the 3 and 4 and 500 range, and they have symptoms. Okay, they are uh, urinating very frequently. They're very thirsty. The body is an amazing chemistry lab, and what it will do is if the sugar is very high, it will, the, your body will make you thirsty because the body thinks that if you drink a lot, you will help to get rid of the sugar. And so people become very thirsty. They drink gallons and gallons of water or soda or juice or whatever the case might be. And then they will urinate out the, the exact same amount that they take in because the body's not absorbing any of the fluid. They're literally drinking in gallons and urinating gallons. They will also feel very hungry because think about it, if the insulin is not available to take the, the nutrients and bring those nutrients into the muscle cells, and uh, then you will be very hungry because you need fuel or food into the muscle cells. Fatigue is another thing that is very common uh, as a symptom of diabetes because, again, the fuel or the glucose is, is not in the muscle cells, it's in the bloodstream. Blurred vision can be a symptom of diabetes. Because what happens is when the blood sugars become very elevated, the sugar literally seeps into every tissue in the body, and it does seep into the lens of the eyes, changing the shape of the lens. And depending on what your baseline lens looks like, sometimes the lens swells and makes the vision better, which is kind of odd, or the lens swells and makes the vision worse, depending on what your, your baseline vision is. That's not the time to get new glasses. It's time to go to the eye doctor and say, what's going on here? And hopefully them asking you, do you have diabetes? Cuts or bruises that are slow to heal, we sort of touched on that a little bit. But when the blood sugars are very high, the red blood cells and the white blood cells can't heal wounds as well as they once did when the blood sugars were normal. And so wounds don't heal as well when the sugars are high. Tingling, pain, or numbness in the hands or the feet, those can be signs of something called neuropathy. And neuropathy can happen even if you don't know that you have diabetes. Because unfortunately, again, if you don't know you have it, complications can happen. Neuropathy is nerve damage where the nerves are dying off, typically in the hands or the, and the feet. And it usually starts in the feet first. And people might feel odd sensations in their, in their toes, 
or under the ball of their foot, like a sock is stuck underneath there, or just not being able to feel their feet as well as they once did. That can be a sign of neuropathy from diabetes. And lastly, we have on here erectile dysfunction in men, uh, or frequent urinary tract infections or vaginal yeast infections in women. In men, uh, a good blood supply and nerve supply is necessary for an erection to occur, and those are the kinds of things that get, uh, or I should say, the blood and the nerves can get damaged from diabetes, and therefore that can affect a man's uh, ability to have an erection. In terms of urinary tract infections or vaginal yeast infections, think about the fact that if the blood sugar is very high and there's lots of sugar in the urine, that's a great setup for a urinary tract infection or yeast infections for women. So how do we diagnose diabetes? There's four ways to diagnose it. And let's just look at these one at a time. There's a special test called A1C, or hemoglobin A1C. Most of you should know what that means, because I would hope that your, your health care provider is testing your A1C every three months. But let's just talk briefly a little bit about what it is. This is a special test that can give us an idea as to what the average blood sugar had been for the previous three months. How does that work? Well, red blood cells can uh, have a special, um, take a liking to glucose or sugar. And so excess sugar does literally stick to everything and it does stick to the red blood cells. And red blood cells are like people. There are always new ones being born and old ones dying. And they live about three months. So we can actually look at the older red blood cells and see how much glucose or sugar has stuck to that red blood cell. And that gives us an idea as to what the diabetes control had been for the previous three months. The goal is to have your A1C less than 6.5 or 7%, depending on um, uh, a few things. And we'll talk about the differences in, in suggestions for A1C in a few moments. But 7% um, or 6.5% are, are the goals. 6.5% uh, is an average blood sugar of about 135. That's the goal when you have diabetes. But let's talk about when you don't have diabetes and you're getting a, this A1C test done, um, a, a, A1C of greater than 6.5 then is a diagnosis for diabetes. So let's just say, again, your friend goes and has their blood done and asks for an A1C to be done, and it comes back at 6.5 or 6.6 .6 or 10.7, whatever the case might be, but it's greater than 6.5. That means that that person has diabetes, and we are able to now use that special A1C test to diagnose diabetes. The second test that we use is a fasting plasma glucose. And so your friend has nothing to eat tonight except water for at least eight hours and goes in tomorrow morning and has a blood sugar drawn. And if the blood sugar is greater or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter, that is a red flag for diabetes. The patient is then supposed to have the test done again. You want to have it double checked. And if the second one is again over 126, then that means the patient has diabetes. The third way we test diabetes is something called an oral glucose tolerance test. And this is something that we don't use as much anymore because the A1C and the fasting plasma glucose are really good tests to check for diabetes. But this is where someone would go into the lab in the morning after fasting, and we would check their fasting blood sugar, and then give them a special sweet drink. It's got a lot of sugar and carbohydrates in it. And then we check, check the person's sugar an hour and two hours later. And if at the two hour mark, the blood sugar is over 200, that would be diagnostic for diabetes. And then the last one would be a random blood check. So let's say 
We just picked somebody off the street and said, let's check your blood sugar. And they say, oh, yeah, I haven't been feeling too good lately. And we check their blood sugar, and it's over 200. And they've been having symptoms, uh, thirst, urination, weight loss, blurry vision. Then that would mean that they have diabetes as well. So several different ways that we can check for diabetes. The two most popular ones are the A1C and the fasting plasma glucose. So now we have the question, so what's the big deal, right? A lot of people may say, again, it's just a little bit of sugar, and so what's the big deal? The big deal is that diabetes is extremely serious. It is a blood vessel disease. It causes damage and irritation and inflammation to the small and large blood vessels in the body. And as it says on the slide, Diabetes can cause severe health problems if not well managed. What kind of health problems? When we talk about small blood vessels, we're talking about the small vessels in the back of the eyes and the small blood vessels in the kidneys. When we talk about large blood vessels, we're talking about the large vessels in the brain, the heart, and the legs. And so people that have diabetes are more prone to those health problems that are on the slide, heart attack or stroke, blindness, kidney failure, nerve damage to the legs and hands, and possibly poor circulation to the legs that can lead to an infection or gangrene. And gangrene meaning that there's, no, there's poor blood supply to the legs. So as you can see, these are serious things. The good news is, is that these things don't happen to everyone and they don't have to happen to you because we have really good ways of treating diabetes. Unfortunately, this is one of those diseases that you are the boss. You will have to manage it, again, with help from your health care provider, from diabetes educators, but you're the manager. And so it's really important that you know that if you don't manage this disease well, it can get away from you. So, Taking care of your diabetes is the next thing we're going to talk about. And as I mentioned, your diabetes care team will help you. Hopefully you have a health care provider that is uh, very savvy in managing your diabetes, that you've seen a diabetes educator, a certified diabetes educator. They're called CDEs, maybe at a local hospital at their diabetes education program or someone in your town or um, area where you live, those folks can help you. Dietitians, nurses, physical therapists, exercise physiologists, your health care provider, they will help you, but the day-to-day -day diabetes care is up to you because you're there with yourself all the time. Like I tell my patients, I can't be with you, so you have to take care of yourself. I'm here if you've got questions. So bottom line is, is that what does that care include? choosing what and how much and when to eat, losing weight if necessary, getting physically active, checking your blood glucose or your blood sugar, taking your medicine, going to your appointments, and learning all that you can about diabetes. It is so important to be educated about this disease, and that's why I call this a roadmap, because you really do need a roadmap to help you navigate diabetes. It's not just eating properly. It's so many other things, as you can see on this list. So testing your sugar is very important, because if you don't test your sugar, how will you know if your exercise and your diet and your medicine is working? You really won't. So when a patient comes to see me and they don't have their blood, blood glucose log with them, it's very difficult for me to make um, you know, responsible and helpful choices as to what to do for them because I have no information. So testing your blood sugar is very important. I think one of the biggest challenges I find with patients is taking their medicine. And if that's something that um, is a challenge for you, you might want to try to work on um, fixing that because, again, that's a big piece of the puzzle that may be missing that could make wonders in your diabetes control if you are taking your medicine properly.
And if anybody has questions about any of these other things, we can talk about them at the end. So treatment and care, choosing what and, and how much and when to eat. We're going to go through each of those bullets um, individually. So as I mentioned earlier, seeing a dietitian is very important, but someone who specializes in diabetes is even more important because that person knows the little special nuances that need to be uh, employed when you have diabetes. Basically, eating healthy, well-balanced portion control meals. Not that you have to give up the, the things that you like, because portion control is important. So a small amount of something that you like is probably a better choice, right, than a large amount of something that you like. Increasing your fiber intake is very important because fiber helps to slow down the absorption of the food in the stomach and may help uh, regulate the blood sugar. So eating foods that are high in fiber, beans, oatmeal, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, in particular uh, fruits that have skin on them like apples, uh, berries, strawberries, those kinds of berries are also very high in fiber. Eating every four to five hours is important. A lot of people say, well, I'm not going to eat because I have diabetes, and that's the worst thing you can do. Your body wants to be fed regularly. And so eating every four to five hours, or sometimes eating every two to three hours, whichever you prefer, is a good way to maintain blood sugar control. But not eating is not a good way to maintain blood sugar control. Because if we think about what I said earlier about the liver, the liver loves to pump out sugar, and it will do that overnight and in between meals. And if you don't eat, that liver will pump out more and more sugar because it thinks that you need fuel because you're not giving your body fuel in the form of food. So it's very important to eat regularly, and that will help tell the liver to stop pumping out all of the sugar that it pumps out. You want to avoid processed foods and use foods that are high in vitamins and minerals and fiber. And of course, we love people to eat a lot of vegetables. Of course, not the starchy ones, corn and peas and carrots and lima beans, although carrots aren't uh, as, as high as the other ones that I mentioned. But lots of vegetables is a wonderful way to get in lots of good nutrition, vitamins, minerals, and typically not gain any weight because vegetables are so low calorie and low carb. You want to have a lot of whole grains, fruits, non-fat dairy, beans, lean meat, poultry, and fish. And you want to think about using the diet as part of the treatment for diabetes. So it's just as important to follow a meal plan as it is to take your medicine, to exercise, and to monitor your blood sugar. What about losing weight? That uh, is something that about 80% of people that have type 2 diabetes need to consider because they are overweight. So weight loss through exercise and eating properly or cutting back on calories is going to help your blood sugar, it's going to help your blood pressure, it's going to help your cholesterol, and it's going to reduce your risk for other health problems. So there is nothing wrong with losing weight as long as you're purposely losing weight and trying to reach a goal um, that's good for your body. Typically, a weight loss of only 5 to 7 percent can do a lot of good for those folks that need to lose weight. Physical activity. This is one of those things that I hate to do, and I have to force myself to do it, but you got to practice what you preach. So exercising is a very good piece of the puzzle, again, for managing diabetes. The um, United States Task Force recommends 150 minutes of aerobic exercise per week and two sessions of weight resistance training, so weight lifting. Okay? And what can this do for you? Obviously, all of those good things we've already talked about, good, better sugar control, blood pressure and, and circulation uh, improvement but also joint flexibility, feeling better, lean body mass and muscle increase, and hopefully reducing the complications of diabetes. So exercise can only do good things. And for those folks that can't exercise because maybe they have heart issues or
back problems, it would be good to get in touch with a physical uh, therapist who can give you good ideas as to what to do to exercise. Some people complain that they have asthma or emphysema. Contacting the American Lung Association, they can give you wonderful ideas as to, uh, as to how to exercise, um, not only for your lung function, improving your lung function, but it will also help with your diabetes control. Let's talk next about blood glucose monitoring. I sure hope that everybody out there that has diabetes is testing their blood sugar. It's important that you know how to use your monitor properly, and this is where uh, working with a diabetes educator can be very helpful because they can make sure you know, they can teach you how to use it, they can make sure you know how to use it on a regular basis. When do you want to test your blood sugar? That's always a question people ask me. Really depends on what kind of medication you're taking and what your goal is, what are you looking for. But we generally tell people to test in the morning a fasting blood sugar because that kind of tells us what that liver has been doing overnight if it's been pumping out a lot of sugar. So it's nice to know what the sugar is in the morning. And then two hours after a meal is a really important time to test because that tells you what the food did to your blood sugar. So that I typically find that cold cereal and bagels really bother people's blood sugars. But cooked oatmeal with an egg beater omelet or um, some protein doesn't have as much of uh, an impact on the blood sugar. So testing out certain kinds of foods two hours after you've eaten them is a really good way to see whether or not you've made the right choice. Keeping a logbook is important so that you can see trends in your sugars. Where are they high? Where are they low? Are they always good at one particular time of day and maybe higher at a different time of day? So that's log logging your sugars and recognizing trends. Also, too, when you log and look at trends, you can see high and low blood sugars. And then you want to get your blood tested every three months for that A1C. So do make sure that your healthcare provider is doing that for you. What are the blood sugar goals? We've already we've talked about the monitoring, and I mentioned earlier about uh, an A1C goal of 6.5 or 7%. There are two organizations out there, the American Diabetes Association, I have that down in the left-hand column, uh, and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, that's in the middle bottom column. Those folks have made recommendations as to what the hemoglobin A1C should be and what the blood sugars, uh, the blood sugar goals should be. The American Diabetes Association recommends an A1C of less than 7%. They recommend a fasting blood sugar and sugar before meals of 70 to 130, and then two hours after a meal of less than 180. Whereas the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists has a little bit of a tighter recommendation the A1C should be less than 6.5, the fasting and before meals less than 110, and two hours after eating less than 140. So depending on which organization you would like to follow, you want to check your sugars sometimes before and sometimes after and hopefully stick within those recommended goals. Let's talk a little bit about taking medication. Many people do need medication for diabetes. Sometimes we give them medication at diagnosis. Sometimes we use pills right off the bat. Sometimes we use insulin immediately depending on how high one's sugar was at diagnosis. Sometimes we can take people off of insulin and put them on pills. Everyone is an individual and so those rules are not for everyone. But we do use, um, we do use medications almost exclusively when someone is diagnosed with diabetes because not only do you have to do exercise and diet and weight loss, but medication can help tremendously with getting your sugars under control. One of the things that I think is important for people that have type 2 diabetes to know is that most people will eventually need insulin because the pancreas cannot keep up producing insulin forever. Think about it. When you're diagnosed with diabetes, about half the cells that make insulin no longer make insulin. And as time goes on, they continue to stop making insulin. So at some point in time, pills won't work anymore, and you will need insulin injections. Okay. 
I'm not sure where that slide went. Uh, okay, going to your appointments is the next slide. We may have lost a slide in there, but this is okay. Uh, going to your appointments. So now, when you see your healthcare provider, it's very important that you see them regularly, not once a year, not every six months, but every three to four months. And the visit should include blood pressure, a yearly EKG, a foot exam by your primary provider. You want to ask about a flu shot every year, a pneumonia shot, a hepatitis vaccine, which is a new recommendation, blood work for your A1C, cholesterol profile, checking for protein in the urine. Very important to see that the kidneys are functioning properly. Uh, your healthcare provider should check your blood sugar blog. Um, they may recommend aspirin. You may want to ask them about that. Uh, discussions of concerns should be something that you would discuss. And probably a visit with a dietitian or a diabetes educator on a yearly basis is not a bad idea. So bottom line here is, is that the treatment and care for diabetes really revolves around you. You learning everything that you can about your diabetes. So I would ask your health care provider to refer you to an American Diabetes Association recognized diabetes education program. Many hospitals have a, a, official programs whereby you can go and take a class to learn about diabetes. And it's not just one class, it's usually several days of learning about diabetes. And generally, you can take a loved one with you so that they can hear what you're hearing and kind of understand what you're going through. Because diabetes is complicated, diabetes educators can make understanding diabetes a lot easier. And so I would definitely try to find a diabetes educator that you can relate to and that can understand what you're going through so that you can contact them with questions. And as we have here, a CDE is a certified diabetes educator who is an expert in diabetes education. So diabetes education gives you a roadmap to follow so you can live a happier and healthier life. And that's what it's all about anyway. So what do you need to do in addition to eating right and monitoring and taking your medication and exercising? Sounds like a lot, right? Well, there's a few other things. And you want to make sure you have a yearly eye exam. Want to perform good skin care using a good lotion on your feet and your legs. Having a daily foot exam by yourself and seeing a podiatrist on a yearly basis or a regular basis for most patients. Good mouth care and regular dental care. Dress reduction, seeing a therapist if necessary, talking to someone about anxiety and uh, issues in your life surrounding diabetes if you have those things. Keeping your health care appointments, very, very important. And probably the most important is getting your medication refilled on time. Please don't stop taking your medicine. If you see that you're running out, make sure you call immediately to get a refill so that you're not skipping doses of medicine because it can make a big difference in your blood sugars. So to kind of finish up here, we have the healthy ABCs, right? A is your A1C, less than 6.5 or less than 7%, and you want to discuss the goal with your health care provider. B is for blood pressure. We'd like blood pressure to be less than 130 over 80 in someone that has diabetes. And C is cholesterol. That reflects the amount of fat in your blood. So ask your health care provider about your good cholesterol, which is the HDL, the bad cholesterol, which is the LDL. We haven't really talked much about that, but that should be under 100. And the triglycerides. So having ABCs all in good control is very important. And only 10% of people in the United States have all three of those in the proper parameters. So it's important that you look at all of those things and try to get them into the uh, correct range. So now, I think we'll go through this very quickly because we're running out of time, but I want to give you the answers. Um, you can, I guess, write them down on a piece of paper and, and um, if you want. But, but bottom line is, is, number one, people with diabetes are at a greater risk of which, of the complica of which complications? Heart attack or stroke, circulation problems and nerve damage, serious eye disease, gum disease, or all of the above? And the obvious answer is all of the above. Number two, 
In order to take care of your diabetes, your health care provider may tell you to make some lifestyle changes. Which of these is a common recommendation? Eat more pasta, rice, and bread. Choose food high in saturated fat. Become more physically active. Or protect your immune system by reducing your activities. And I hope you all guessed three, becoming more physically active. Question number three, what is an A1C? I hope you all get this one right. Is it a blood test that shows your average blood sugar over the past two to three months? Is it a blood test performed by daily by people with diabetes? Is it a blood test that measures cholesterol? Or is it a urine test done to help diagnose diabetes? And of course, it's number one. It shows your average blood sugar. True or false, people with type 2 diabetes cannot eat food that take, contain sugar. And of course, the answer to that is false. Number five, it is generally recommended to be active for how much time each day? And the answer is number two, 30 minutes. True or false, a good method for maintaining weight and controlling blood sugar is to skip meals. And of course, that is false. Number seven, true or false, I can stop taking my blood pressure, diabetes, and or cholesterol medicine when the numbers become normal. The answer is false. And a lot of people unfortunately do that, but the reason why the numbers became normal was because of the medicine. So you must continue to take your medicine. Number eight, true or false, having to take insulin means my pancreas is not making much insulin anymore and the pills are probably not working as well. The answer to that is true. It's not your fault that you have to take insulin, it's your pancreas' fault. Number nine, if I have a blood sugar that's less than 70, I should do nothing and be glad it's low. I should eat a chocolate candy bar to bring the blood sugar into the normal range. Or I should eat 15 grams of a simple sugar, wait 15 minutes, and test again. If it's still low, repeat the simple sugar treatment, wait 15 minutes, and test again. Once the sugar is greater than 70, have a snack or eat a meal. Or should I call 911? I hope you all chose number three, where you want to treat low blood sugar reaction on your own, and if it doesn't get any better, you need to let your health care provider know. Number 10, all of the medications below can cause low blood sugar except metformin, Genuvia, Anglisa, Trigenta, and Vulcana. Number two, insulin. Number three, glimepiride, glipizide, gliburide. Or number four, Crandin and Starlix. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go over all of these medications, but many medications that we use for diabetes can cause low blood sugar. But the ones in the number one um, choice, metformin, genuvia, anglisa, trigenta, and invocana, do not cause low blood sugar. The other medications can potentially cause low sugar. Okay, we are completed with slides, and if you have some questions, we are going to see if anybody has any questions. And we're going to wait to see if anybody has any questions. While we're waiting, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule because we're all so busy. So the fact that you came on and listened this morning is a testament to the fact that you're interested in learning more about your diabetes. So if you'd like to ask a question, just type your question into the chat box and we'll see it and we'll answer it for you. Don't be shy. We don't know who you are, and we'd love to help you further if you have any questions. Up on the screen while we're waiting, I do have some information about the American Diabetes Association. They are a wonderful, wonderful resource for, uh, for patients. Um, they have a great website, and you can also call 1-800-DIABETES and speak with someone if you need educational material. Up, oh, we have a question. I use the pen type injections for insulin. Does it help? I'm going to assume that we're talking about um, an insulin, an insulin pen, and certainly uh, using a pen versus a vial of insulin. And I'm not sure if that's what the question is referring to. Um, it doesn't really matter how you deliver your insulin, either through a syringe or a pen. Um, 
it's a, but a pen is wonderful because it's, it's a nice convenient item to carry with you uh, whenever you go anywhere. So when you, if you're, I'm not sure if you're using the pen uh, with long-acting insulin in it or if you're using the pen with short-acting insulin in it. But either way, the, um, the pen is a wonderful way to deliver insulin. Okay. The next question is, why does illness raise glucose? Oh, wonderful, wonderful question. When you're sick, the blood sugars can be elevated. Think of this. Whenever there is a stressor in your life, your blood pressure goes up, your uh, heart rate goes up, and your blood sugar can go up. And a stressor can be either physical stress like illness or emotional stress. The reason being is because there are many, many hormones that are released in the body during illness. And um, adrenaline is released, cortisol is released, these kinds of hormones can raise the blood sugar, uh, as well as the blood pressure and the uh, blood uh, and the uh, pulse. And so, when you're ill, believe it or not, you may actually need more medication than when you're not ill, because the sugars typically will, can be elevated. Not all the time, but when you're ill, you need to test your sugar more often, not less often and report to your healthcare provider if your sugars are running high. We have another question. I was told there is an inhaler for insulin. Is this right? Well, there, believe it or not, I, I personally just saw something um, recently that there is a company that is working on an inhaled insulin. There was an inhaled insulin several years ago called Exubra, which was taken off the market because not a lot of people were very interested in it. Um, but there is another company that is making an inhaled insulin. So, so you're right, and I guess I would say stay tuned. Any final questions? We've had some nice questions. If anybody else has any, this is your opportunity to type it in right into the chat box where it says type message here. We still have a couple of minutes. Why does the stomach bloat because of insulin? Well, I'm not so sure if the, the bloating is from the insulin. You may want to have that evaluated by um, your health care provider. Um, there you may have some uh, stomach issues. There is something called gastroparesis, which is a, um, a delayed emptying of the stomach, and that can cause bloating. That's not from insulin, but that's a complication of diabetes. So a, a bloated stomach needs to be evaluated by your physician or your health care provider. Good questions. Anybody, anybody else out there? We have about a minute, so we, we'd still love to hear from you. I'm going to keep talking a more about the importance of having diabetes education. If you've got uh, a hospital or a clinic nearby that has a diabetes educator, take advantage of those folks. It's very, very important. doesn't matter how long you've had diabetes, you can always learn something new. Well, I think um, we've just got about 30 seconds left, and we have no more questions. So what I'd like to do now is, is thank you. So oh, hold on for one more. I have a, one more question coming. OK. We're waiting for one more question. So I hope, that while we're waiting, uh, I would just like to say that I hope this has been helpful for you. Oh, here we have a question. I have a small wound on my leg, which is being treated. Glucose is a little else. What else can I do other than insulin? Well, let me answer the question this way, because I'm not 100% sure um, what you're taking now, but insulin 
is always going to work. And when you have an infection, typically pills are not strong enough. You really need to get the blood sugars into the normal range in order for that wound to heal. And although it might not be pleasant to think about taking insulin, in using a pen, as someone mentioned earlier, is a very easy and painless way of taking insulin. And insulin really is the best when you have an infection um, uh, to get those sugars down. We have another question. When insulin controls the sugar, why does one have to take other medicines at the same time? Very good question. So insulin, uh, let me give you the short answer on that, and that would be if you weren't taking those other pills, you might need a lot more insulin. So sometimes taking the pills is a great way, uh, is, is a wonderful um, combination to use with insulin. I have plenty of patients that take pills but might only be on one shot of insulin. Um, if they didn't take the pills, they might need to be on four shots of insulin. So taking pills and insulin together is a very common way to treat diabetes. Okay, I think we've gone over our time. Uh, I want to respect the fact that you probably all have other things to do. So thank you so very much for, for being here this morning, and I wish you all the best in managing your diabetes. Bye-bye now. <laughs>